Okay. Hi, and welcome to the Billings Public Library. Thanks for coming to our Friday night fun Zoom event with author Rebecca Weber. She will be talking about her newly published mid-grade children's novel, The Painter's Butterfly, as well as reading from it. We do have a copy available for you to put on hold if you'd like to check it out. If you have any questions, I'll be coming around at the end with a microphone after her presentation. Also, this event will be recorded and put on the library's YouTube channel. Thank you. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, my name is Rebecca, and I would like to open my chat today with a quote from Vincent Van Gogh, because my book is themed around art, so it's very, and actually I include this quote in the beginning of the book, and it says, I feel that there is nothing more truly artistic than to love people. Um, so a little bit about me and my beginning in this whole journey of becoming an author. I was a reader first. I was actually disciplined with books when I would uh, do something I wasn't supposed to. That was the only way that my parents could get like uh, get me to comply was they would take my books away. <laughs> Sounds kind of silly, but um, I have very uh, specific memories of that. I also have always loved to write as well as read. Um, in second grade, I got a card from my second grade teacher. It says, you're a great author. It says, dear Rebecca, congratulations on having your story published in the Sunday Star newspaper. You are so talented. So even in second grade, I was like, oh, this is really cool to have stuff that I've written down published in a newspaper. So that kind of like gave me the writing bug a little bit. Um, we fast forward to high school where I met Katie um, and I was a part of the literary magazine in high school, which was primarily, I would write poetry, um, but I did that all four years and we put a book out at the end of each year and that was a really fun experience for me. And um, I was definitely a poet first. So you'll kind of see that descriptive tendency within the text of my book. And I'm trying to learn how to balance the descriptiveness with uh, pacing so that I don't lose the signature of my writing. But at the same time, um, I know there are, t I tend to over describe. So it's, it's been a learning curve this whole process. But still in high school, my sister was a preteen and she knew that I loved to write. And she came to me with a proposition. And she was a huge fan at that time, still probably, of Johnny Depp. And she said, you need to write a story that if it's turned into a movie, I can act in the movie with Johnny Depp. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, this was a good challenge. I'm like, oh, let me think about this a little bit. And I needed a book about a middle-aged man and a preteen girl where the girl was an artist so that I knew my sister would be cast in the role because she was very good at art. I'm like this, I gotta work this out. And I that was where the painter's butterfly was born from. Um, and then I set it to the side for 15 years and uh, just kind of thought about it. Uh, I didn't actually, I had written the first chapter, which in the end turned out to be the second chapter of the finished book, but it took 15 years for me to really commit to writing the full story. So in 2020, as everyone knows, little thing called the pandemic, we're all trapped inside our houses. And um, I decided to take my dream of writing a book seriously. And uh, so I sat down and I had the idea in my back pocket, you know, Painter's Butterfly about a middle-aged man and a preteen foster child and their relationship and how they bond through art. And I wrote and I finished the first draft probably within two months time because I was sitting and writing every day because we had lockdown and all of that. We were trapped inside the house. But when I finished the first draft, I made uh, an error in judgment. I said, oh, this is awesome. This is ready to send to all of the publishing gurus and the agents and the everybody's going to love it. So I started querying that book way too early, um, did not get a lot of interest at first because of course I'm still learning how that whole process works. And the book needed to be edited way many more times than I had. So um, it took me, I'm proud to say though, 
after editing for months and querying for months, it took me probably about eight months or so to get that first contract. And I signed with a small press who uh, liked a pitch that I had written on a, a Twitter event for writers. And I was so overjoyed. I'm like, oh my gosh, I signed with a press with my first ever book. I'm going to be a debut author. This is awesome. Oh, unfortunately, small presses do not always survive in the publishing industry. So I was signed with them for a good six, seven months. And on the day that I was supposed to release my cover, uh, information came to light that they were not doing so well. And so I had to make a decision to uh, withdraw from the contract because it did not bode well for this press. And uh, I didn't want my book to sink with the ship. So I was heartbroken. I grieved for a while about losing the contract and having to start over. But then I like picked myself up and I started querying again. And within four months, I had secured a second contract with a different publisher who I'm happy to say Artemisia Publishing based out of New Mexico. Um, they are the ones who finally brought my book to fruition. So that was really exciting. And that's just a little note of the publishing industry is hard. If you love to write and it's not working out right away, don't write it off yet. Uh, you could find a way to make it work. You just have to be a little flexible and definitely very stubborn. <laughs> so my book, Painter's Butterfly, is about a foster child named Nova, and she goes to her most recent placement, which is a farmhouse in the middle of nowhere with a middle-aged man named Mr. Russell. And Nova has issues with trusting other people um, because she has lived a very nomadic life. So she's moved around from house to house to house and nothing's ever really stuck. So she has learned to trust only herself and she has leaned on her art as therapy. So Nova draws, uh, just like my sister drew, actually. She in was inspired by my sister and has always used that to cope with her emotions. But um, in the beginning of the story, we kind of see where her head is at prior to going um, and meeting Mr. Russell. And I'm actually going to read that first chapter. It's called Moonlight says, on any other night, the glowing sheen of ivory moonlight against shiny hardwood floors would have been a pretty sight to behold. But as Nova crouched close to the ground and carefully maneuvered her bedroom door shut, blood pounded in her ears at the stark vulnerability of this eerie light. The group home sat stock still as if waiting for her to make a mistake and alert the caretakers to her escape plan. She held her breath and listened beyond the ruckus of her heart. The entire facility hung suspended in a far-off dreamland. Not even the flutter of moth wings puttered against the nearby window pane. Maybe she'd be able to pull this off after all. Shouldering her backpack and stealing her resolve, she lowered her belly to the floor and crept down the corridor, inching like a sneaky caterpillar to the back stairs, the ones that led to the kitchen. The front foyer would be a stupid move, with the manager's office ablaze in light, even at this hour. Nova could picture the manager tilted back in her wooden rocking chair, facing the office entrance, entrance should any foster kids wake from a nightmare and need a cool glass of water. Even in sleep, the woman was diligent, so Nova would have to exit through the backyard. A cold sweat dropped down the curve of her neck as she scuffled toward the shadowy staircase, fingertips scratching against the fibrous wood floor. Freedom rang in her ears like a beautiful ballad. Nova, it sang, go home. But home had never been anything more than a gamble, a game she always lost. She was ready to play her only hand. Gently, she tackled the staircase, one creaky step after another. She tiptoed along the edges of the boards, shifting her weight to keep the house's groans minimal. Nova had thrown her hair into a ponytail to keep it out of her face, but the hairdo pulled at the corners of her forehead, and she grimaced, wishing desperately to free her locks. Soon. At the bottom of the stairs, Nova peeked around the corner to investigate the empty kitchen. The normal bustle of children and staff had vanished, like someone had taken an eraser to the scene and scrubbed out the people. She allowed herself a small intake of air as she ogled the back door. Nova knew the manager liked to make hourly rounds to check on the children. A clock above the stove ticked to urge her on. 
Tensing her shoulders, she sprang into action. Hopping expertly to the back door, Nova unlatched the chain and twisted the deadlock with a feverish click, squeezing her hands against the doorknob to gather the last of her nerves. Softly, she coaxed the door open, praying under her breath this, this decision was the right one. A small cough echoed behind her and she froze. Twisting her head to the side, Nova spotted a tiny silhouette lurking in the opposite door frame. One of the youngest foster boys in red fire truck pajamas, thumbs stuffed in his mouth and unruly black hair contorted into weird shapes. Nova raised a trembling finger to her lips and made eye contact with the boy. Please, she begged him telepathically, don't tell. He didn't move. She took her brief chance, slinking out the door and into the darkness beyond. She hurried around the side of the group home, gripping her backpack to keep her hands from shaking. Was she really going to do this? Nova had a hunch where she belonged, but the journey would not be easy. And even when she arrived, she'd have to fight for her place. But maybe that's the point of a bet. If you win, the prize is worth it. And what did she have to lose? But Nova didn't even make it to the driveway. Fate doesn't always cooperate. A strong hand caught her by the arm and a familiar voice whispered in her ear, it's always the quiet ones. The manager waggled a disapproving finger close to her nose and clung to Nova's shoulders, guiding her dutifully back into the group home. The pale moon cried above them, tears of shimmering moondrops speckled along the pavement, a reflection of Nova's resounding disappointment. She pondered struggling for a moment, pushing the woman to the side and bolting down the driveway to the street. Deep in her heart, Nova knew she wouldn't get far. Ripping her hair tie from her head, she shook out her tresses and released the tension in her muscles. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon. Home is where the heart is, and Nova's heart knew one reality, Nomad. So in the first chapter, we kind of see how she has in the back of her head um, an idea of her definition of family. And then throughout the course of the book, um, we learn a little bit more about where she truly belongs, which is kind of cool. And art sort of helps her get there, which I think that a big theme of this book is art appreciation. And I, like I said, my sister was and still is a phenomenal artist, and I've always been jealous of that ability. So uh, what better thing to do than write it in a book? Um, some of the things that they don't tell you when you pursue publishing, you'll never want to read your book again because after editing it 10 to 12 times it's like uh yeah I'm good thanks and you set it on the shelf and you forget about it um certainly exciting to have other people read it and I know my husband feels very much the same way because he read it four or five times and he's like yeah I'm good on this one for a while <laughs> <laughs> something else they don't tell you uh imposter syndrome is your greatest enemy so basically the entire process of writing the book and then publishing it, you're fighting against yourself. All those self-doubts that you have in your head that tell you, oh, this isn't good enough, you know, and you deal with a lot of rejection, which sort of reinforces those thoughts of wondering if it's good enough. And um, that I would say was one of the toughest parts of publication was the imposter syndrome. But all the blood, sweat and tears are worth it when you get to hold your book like a real live book in your hands. And my best advice for writers would be to find a support group of like-minded writers, because then when you get those rejections from agents or publishers, you have people to fall back on who kind of like have an objective view of it, where if you are have negative self-talk going through your head, they can kind of talk you out of it and dust you off and say, hey, you can do it. And that support group really makes all the difference in the world. Uh, when you're going through the process. So when Nova arrives at her new house with Mr. Russell, he keeps a whole bunch of secrets, which definitely doesn't help her trust issues. And um, while exploring the house, she finds an easel in the attic. So Mr. Russell's a painter. And immediately it sparks her interest when she finds this easel. And she feels like it's special. And she's never really kind of like, pursued painting at all. So uh, she's nervous to try it, but she feels compelled. And so without asking permission, Nova sneaks into the attic and uses the easel to paint a picture. So my second expert excerpt is actually going to be uh, that painting session that she has, the first one. So I will, and if you want to turn to your, in your book to one page 121, that's where we'll start. 
says Nova started to doubt her plan and her ability the moment she picked up the paintbrush. She had practiced with pencils before, but all of this felt so foreign and new. Not only that, but she was an intruder in Mr. Russell's personal sanctuary. She hadn't asked permission and risked losing his trust. Worst case scenario, he would send her back to the home and never want to see her again. Her chest felt heavy, weighted with the possibility. One thought kept her going forward. She had come this far. If she was living in this house, she deserved to know the whole story. She lacked her fears and inhibitions deep away in her mind as she'd practiced over the years. Nova then selected the first color for the butterfly, a vibrant yellow akin to the sunshine room. With her special drawing clipped to the top of the easel, Nova paced herself, recreating the image. She lost herself in the movement of the brush strokes. Swaying back and forth, she conjured the butterfly's curves and edges. Her lines were not as meticulous as the picture, but there was a beauty to them all the same. She wiped the brush on a towel to clean it when she needed to switch colors and added dots of shadowing where necessary. Occasionally, she would scamper to the staircase to view her painting from afar. The whole experience was beyond refreshing. Nova felt more at peace than she had in a long time. This piece was particularly surprising because she had never been able to look at the drawing without overwhelming sadness. The minutes turned to hours and gradually the canvas transformed into a representation of a butterfly. Nova stepped back for a final time to assess her work. Though it was not an exact copy of her precious picture, she was proud of the level of detail she was able to achieve. The eraser was an essential part of her regular drawing process. Any mistakes could be easily remedied or adapted. Painting was a different experience entirely. To fix mistakes while painting, she had to consider the best ways to cover them up. She made some errors in the painting that could not be undone, but she combined the misplaced colors in such a way they became an integrated part of the art. She subconsciously knew they were there and wished she could make them disappear. Overall, for her first painting ever, she was surprisingly pl pleased by the finished product. She used the smallest brush to etch her first name into the bottom corner of the canvas. Nova then held it up with pride to study it some more. She couldn't stop smiling a lovely crescent from ear to ear. Nova jolted out of her reverie when Amigo started barking again from the front porch. It didn't sound as urgent as his howls earlier. She snuck to the window and craned her neck to see out. Mr. Russell's truck was making its way up the road back to the house. A stone dropped into the pit of her stomach. He was early. This was the worst case scenario. She would lose his trust. Bolting from the window, Nova nabbed her drawing, the palette, the dirty towel, and the paintbrushes. In her haste, she did not have time to hide the painting. She would have to keep Mr. Russell out of the attic until she had the chance to retrieve it. Skidding down the stairs, she launched into the bathroom and tossed the brushes into the sink. Water on full blast, she scrubbed them as quickly as she could. Glancing over her shoulder every now and again, Nova strained to hear Mr. Russell's entrance over the slush of the faucet. Amigo was continuing to bark, and now, faintly, she deduced the bang of a car door. Not enough time. Wrapping the paintbrushes in the dirty towel and covering the palette the same way, she leapt into the sunshine room and stuffed her supplies under the bed, then sprinted toward the stairs. She heard the front door or open and Amigo's paws scuttling on the hardwood as he finally gained entrance. Her cover story was already taking shape in her mind. Nova's eyes were wide and alarmed. Her hair looked wild atop her head from her frantic race. She patted it down and tried to compose herself before bonding down the stairs to the kitchen. Showtime. Had she been paying more attention, she may have noticed that Dakota remained on the top step to the attic, entranced by light dancing about in the room. The kitten's eyes glowed gold with the reflection from the easel. A hazy shimmer of effervescence descended from the tip top of the easel across the painting. The golden glitter looked like a cloud of fireflies blinking in a nighttime field. The entire canvas lit up momentarily, so brilliant was the shine turned her head to look away. When she looked back, Nova's artistry was gone. The canvas sat clean and crisp and untouched atop the easel. The butterfly had vanished into thin air. So that scene really depicts uh, what's on the cover of the book, which is the first, obviously Nova's first painting is a butterfly. And uh, it essentially comes to life, but she doesn't know it yet. So this is where the magic really kicks off and kind of like extends from there into more and more different adventures. And 
it's sort of fun. The idea that art can come to life. I know that's uh, something that a lot of artists would probably be uh, interested in trying. So throughout this book, um, as I said, there's themes of art appreciation, but then also we have like themes of found family, magic, and grief. It is a little bit serious in moments because it deals with the idea of loss and how to like bounce back after losing um, someone that you care about. And I would like to take a second to thank all of the people who helped shape the book, my beta readers, my family, friends, uh, the illustrators, which actually, if you look inside, I was lucky enough because I had a small publisher that my sister was able to do all of the illustrations for the chapter headings. So all of the interior illustrations are by my sister and then a wonderful artist named Tess Kane created the cover, which I absolutely love. I would also like to thank uh, my publisher, Artemisia Publishing, and all of you for your interest in my story and also uh, Billings Public Library for allowing me to speak. Um, my book is available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and uh, uh, Target and Walmart.com, which I didn't realize till just recently. Someone said, oh, I got it off of Target. I'm like, I didn't even know it was on Target, but that's cool. <laughs> uh, so last piece of advice from Nova is paint your own life. If you have a dream, chase it. Um, it's important that we take an active role in what we hope to achieve while we're alive. And I'm happy that you have an interest in Nova's story and you can follow her on her own journey. And now we'll open it up to Q&A if anybody has any questions. Is there going to be a follow-up to this book? Uh, I do have sequel ideas. But I have been in the interim of time since um, I signed my contract January of, now I got to think, 2022. And in that period of time, in between signing and when it was published, I've actually worked on two other manuscripts, completely unrelated. And I'm querying my third manuscript now in the hopes of finding an agent. So while I have a sequel for The Painter's Butterfly in mind, it is not what I am currently uh, actively working on. Do you, do you plan to have like, just like three or five, or, or do you think there'd be like eight of them or something like that? Total, like as in all the books I ever write? No, for like this one. For This like particular book, probably only two. Oh. Because I know originally I meant it as like a standalone, but then when I was thinking a little bit about where I could go with it, um, I thought of some cool ideas that if there's ever like a desire for people to want to read more, um, it would be neat to take it in the path that I kind of have in my head. <laughs> and the publisher had me change the ending of the book to leave it a little more open-ended so that uh, potentially a sequel could work out a little better. And that movie with Johnny Depp, right? Yes. My sister's too old now because it's been 15 years. I always apologize to her. Sorry, Sarah. It took me too long. She could but, still uh, be a teen. <laughs> she's still short enough. Yeah. Yeah, she's short enough for sure. But uh, hopefully one day, if it ever gets turned into a movie, maybe Johnny Depp will just reach out and say, hey, I'd love to chat with your sister because that would make her <laughs> her whole life probably. <laughs> Any other questions, even about like the writing process or the publishing process? It's been a learning experience, that's for sure. How did, did you, for the publishing, did you, like, I know there were, back in the day when I try to write some books and I sent out stuff, you know, there was a book and it was like in different like categories of like, you know, like children's, you know, like teen, adult. They still, I mean, I'm sure it's all on the internet now, but um, is that how you started or? Um, there's a bunch of different sites that are dedicated to uh, like the organization of all the information because agents and publishers have specific things they're looking for. Like you were saying, like related to the genres and the age groups and stuff. So you have to do a ton of research. 
um, because the agent has to be looking for what it is that you're selling. So you can't just send it to anybody. You've got to research what it is that they want first. And the same for like small presses. Small presses are really the only way you can go if you don't have an agent because the big presses don't generally accept um, uh, submissions from people who are unagented. So you've got a couple different like tiers of things you can do. You could potentially self-publish. That's getting even bigger. Um, obviously, Amazon, KDP, people uh, publish through Amazon and sort of like run their own uh, book empire, which is kind of cool. I know some self-published authors that do great work. Uh, and then the small press, obviously, you don't need an agent to send them your story, which is really nice. And you get a little more flexibility in the decisions. Like for instance, I had the artwork that I wanted to use and the publisher was willing to incorporate that. Whereas if I had gone with a big New York City press, um, they would have made all those decisions for me. And uh, they also require obviously the agent. So um, there's a lot involved. There's definitely a ton of research and it takes a lot of time. And then a lot of rejections. Like I queried, I wanna say a hundred agents with this debut and I only got three or four uh, requests for more of the story. So that was uh, both discouraging, but then also exciting. It's like, oh, I actually got requests. That's kind of neat. So is there a limit you could send to, uh, not like the query, but like when they ask for stuff, I mean, can you only do it at like one at a time? I know back in the day, it was like, mm -hmm. you can only do it one at a time to get a, you gotta hear from them before you can send to them. Yes. You have to, many agencies will have that little rule where they're like, you can query a single agent at once. Once you get rejection from them, then you can query again. Or sometimes the agencies even say, if you get a rejection from one person, it's an umbrella rejection. So you can't query anybody else at the agency. So it's like, everybody has their own rules, which is intimidating, but, uh, I, I'm glad that at least with this third book, I have a better understanding of what agents expect. And I went into it with my eyes open instead of thinking, oh, they're going to sign this right away. No problem. <laughs> Why didn't you choose self-publishing? Um, The issue with self-publishing is anybody can self-publish. So the market is very much inundated with self-published books. So it's a lot more difficult to get noticed and then um, get put into the bookstores. Like there's certain requirements that go along with if a bookstore will consider adding your book to the shelf. And to my understanding, they are starting to put self-published books like in Barnes and Noble, but they require that the author makes contact with each and every store to kind of secure that. So for distribution purposes, and because I'd never published a book before, I wanted to have someone with experience in the industry helping to kind of guide me on what to do and then also have them to help me push it into actually, which I'm hoping that's the next chapter of my journey is figuring out how to get it into as many bookstores as I can. Are you after, are you trying to get an agent, did you say? Mm-hmm. For the third one, I have a, my third book is a middle grade contemporary story about a young girl with anxiety entering middle school. And she hasn't spoken in five years um, because she has some past family trauma and stuff um, she's not dealt with. But that story, um, there are certain stories that are very mainstream and what the publishers are looking for right now. And then others that they don't see as marketable, which isn't necessarily true. Um, I think that any book, if you find the audience is marketable, but anyway, big presses. The This idea of anxiety and dealing with anxiety and uh, coping with your issues in a healthy way is very big with agents and publishers right now. So this is the book that I think I'll be able to push into that space and hopefully get somebody's interest. We'll see. I've queried I want to say probably around 50 agents so far. And right now there's two or three people that have the full manuscript and they're reading it, which is great. So, I will take those numbers. <laughs> so can you have different agents for different kinds of books? 
for yes and they're saying that uh nowadays agents are really only signing authors for a singular book like there's no guarantee that they'll help you publish anything additional um though they do often have first rights to like looking at it and deciding but um yeah it's i mean it's changing it's tough and then barnes and noble recently changed their policy too on how they stock books they're not stocking as many books by lesser known authors anymore, especially in like the children's literature sections. So they're focusing on like the big New York Times selling authors and the rest are solely available online, which is unfortunate, but that's the industry for you. <laughs> was, was financing this book uh, uh, problem to consider? Um, there was definitely costs that went into it. I know I I personally uh, commission. I had the art commission, so I paid for the art for the book, um, and then all of the supplies for promoting it. So I got bookmarks to take with me to signings, and uh, business cards, and we put on a little release party on February seventh, which was really cool. But I funded all of that. And then the, that's another great thing about getting a small press or a big press is they cover the uh, the cost of the release in terms of like editing and um, all of the legwork that goes into formatting the book and then having it actually printed. I know my publisher sent me a complimentary box of books to use for promotional things. So there's a there is cost that goes along with it. Um, very dependent upon what avenue of publishing that you're doing. So, so this, I, oh, go ahead. So sure. If you get once, say if you get an agent. So do they get a percent, and then the publishers get a percent? Yeah, the the author's share is definitely more watered down the more people are involved. So I probably percentage wise have a higher percentage being that it's just the publisher than someone who has both an agent and a publisher because they both need pieces of that then. Um, so it's incredible. Like, and you, you study the numbers, like you can find the percentages online that are most typical and the authors do not make very much money on books. So it's like very few authors get rich doing this. Yeah. Which is okay. It's about the stories, so. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And I hope that you, everybody enjoys the book. Like I said, it's on Amazon. It's on Barnes Noble. Um, it would be awesome if anybody does read it, if you could leave a review in those places because the reviews really bump up how many people can see it online. So that makes like all the difference in the world. And then if you know a child, like a middle grade child, anyone eight to 12 who loves to read, please pass the book along to them because that's the most difficult thing is getting connected with those kids. I haven't done any school visits yet, but I'm excited to actually go in and talk to kids about the story because that's really who I'm writing for. So thank you very much for having me again, Billings Library, and uh, for listening to me chat. I love to talk about books. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>